Welcome to the Understanding Boys podcast. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the Boonarong people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to their leaders past, present and emerging. The Understanding Boys podcast is a series of conversations exploring what it is to be a good man these days. And if you had a story that you could tell a boy of say 14 and he'd listen, what would that story be? And that's really what I'm asking our guests today. I'm Dr. Ray Swan, and we're a community of teachers and parents concerned with the education and growth of boys and young men in the modern world. This series is brought to you by Brighton Grammar, an all-boys school in Melbourne. To learn more about the podcast, please visit understandingboys.com.au. Today we speak with Dr. Kylie King. Kylie works at the Turner Institute for Brain and Mental Health at Monash University as a fellow. She holds a doctorate worked as a psychologist and a researcher across a range of domains, but most notably in suicide prevention. In our conversation today, we talk a little bit about family life, about her work and research, what are some of the things that are leading to uh, the prevalence of suicide, particularly amongst males, and then also shares some of the ideas around prevention, uh, how to hold conversations, some good resources for parents, and finally her thoughts on what it is to be a good man. I hope you enjoy the conversation. So joining us now on the podcast is Dr. Kylie King. Kylie, thank you so much for your time in advance. We're so glad you can uh, you can join us today to to, uh, to share a bit about your story um, and a bit about your work. Well, you're very welcome. It's lovely to be here. So let's start. Um, you know, you've had a, a really interesting career. You know, firstly in in psychology and and practice, and then moving into research. Uh, you're in suicide prevention research, and we'll, we'll touch on. Um, suicide prevention research in a, in a little bit, um, but all these things, of course, under the broader umbrella of you know mental health. What are some of the milestones or some of the things that led you into the work that you do? Oh, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Why does someone become a psychologist? We could <laughs> probably spend a few hours on a psychotherapist coach working couch working that out, couldn't we? Yeah. I mean, psychology was always something I was interested in and just drawn to, I suppose, in the idea about um, giving people a voice and listening to people and really just a sort of curiosity in how people work and how people think and, you know, um, how people, you know, sort of get into the situations they get into that that cause them problems. And so I was just really sort of curious about that. And then I worked in that space for a while, primarily working with people with um, gambling problems, Mm -hmm. which is, I guess, where I kind of first got my exposure to working with men because you come across a lot of men in that line of work. So, and again, just really interested to try to understand, um, you know, there's a lot of stigma around gambling problems. So trying to understand, you know, why, why is it that someone would do this to themselves? Mm. It's kind of the big question. And then through doing that work, I became sort of much more interested in the the potential for, uh, I suppose, bigger interventions and like population level interventions and sort of working with the sort of bigger and broader social factors that we know go on to create problems in people's lives and put them at risk for mental health problems. So that kind of moved me over into into research and I started working at the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health. So really interested in that kind of population level health and what we can be doing at that level to bring about change and positive impacts for people. And um, that got me into suicide prevention because I guess suicide really is a public health issue and a lot of the determinants of suicide are social determinants and big sort of population level factors that we know can create um, increased risk for people. So there's a, there's a, a big sort of hub of suicide prevention researchers within that school and that's how I got involved in that. And then when you work in suicide prevention, it becomes quite apparent that we know that three quarters of suicide deaths every year are by men in Australia, as they are in many countries, um, Western countries across the world. And so it begs the question of, of why, why is this happening? Yeah. What is it about men or the, the context that men live in that create this risk or this increased risk? And so I suppose that's how I kind of slowly got over to thinking about um, men's mental health and men's suicide prevention for boys and men sort of specifically. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that all makes complete sense. And I can see that, that trajectory around, I guess, experiencing it at a counseling psychology level 
um, and then sort of thinking about, well, how can I, you know, influence or understand and then moving more into that public health space and, you know, in, in Rangam. We actually have never spoken to anyone um, on the podcast so far about um, gambling, gambling addiction and the impacts, you know, on families and on and men. And I wasn't aware of the the split in terms of gender in gambling, but but I as I as I understand it from what you just said, is that there is it that there are more men that that have gambling problems? I think when I was working then, I probably saw about half 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 men, half women, which is kind of unusual because in psychology practice, you often end up seeing a lot of women, mm. and so it's a bit different. So I think sort of historically, a lot of people with gambling problems have been men, like coming out of you know the TAB gambling, and then with the introduction of um, the pokies then we see a lot more women coming into problem gambling. So then that sort of brought more sort of women into experiencing problem gambling. But, um, yeah, historically it had been more men. So just, you know, you've got your kids in the background there. I mean, yes. how do you, you know, how do you manage it all? You, you know, as a, as a, you were saying, you know, mom, you've got three boys. Um, how, how, do you mind me asking how old and just sharing with the listeners, just, you know, how old are your boys? Are they in primary or secondary? Or? Oh, my, my oldest is um, 15 in year nine. And then um, I have to think about it now. The next one's in year five <laughs> and then year three. So okay. almost 11 and eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've managed that spread quite well, obviously. Yeah, it's worked <laughs> out okay, <laughs> yeah. I think. Yeah, and is it true yeah. that the, the oldest is, you know, sort of breaking you in as a parent and then the second and the third? Are there any of those sort oh, of absolutely. Tropes, um happening? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think the, the third one definitely gets the easier ride, <laughs> but um, probably just because I'm far less anxious parent the third time around. Yeah, it's so, funny, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And my first one is um, definitely a boundary pusher. So right. he's <laughs> absolutely paving the way for the other two. <laughs> oh, very good. I, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that that space isn't around those connections and how different our kids can be. And I know a few guests have shared their stories of their, of their children and just Wow, they are so different, and and they, I guess, as as parents, uh, you know, they really, um, they require different things from us, you know. And I mm. guess having three at, at such, you know, profoundly life sort of changing times, a lot going on for all those boys, um, that they and they're all being different, you know, how much that would that would take from you? Is is there any, you know, is there any Dr. King kind of you know <laughs> messages around managing a house of three boys, particularly in lockdown, that you're able to share? I don't know. I just try to be really um, sort of transparent, you know, as much yeah. as is appropriate. Yeah. But, you know, try to be collaborative and try to be sort of open about, you know, things I'm unsure of or things we're still working out or. Yeah. Yeah. And that's know. so much part of it, isn't it? It's about that building that understanding of, you know, the world in which they're in and that, you know, experiences of relationships and boundaries and, knowing who they are and their impact on others. You know, I know with, with my own kids, you know, a lot of our conversations, mine are a little bit older now, so, um, but they're, they're still in that, you know, how do we understand, you know, their, ourselves and, you know, the impact of who we are in, in, in the small group like a family and, and how that might then, you know, prepare them for life, you know, in, in those sorts of things as well, you know, a lot of our family dinner conversations still seem to be around, particularly now that in Melbourne we've gone back into a, into a lockdown, um, you know, around the, you know, how I'm impacting on other people in, in the space. You know, I made a, a terrible misjudgment yesterday, um, Kylie. I tried to bring a family together to watch a movie. I picked the wrong film. Uh, and then I made another misjudgment was that um, one of the, we have a blanket that kind of normally lives out sort of, in the lounge and uh, it was in my son's room. I went into his room. I uh, didn't get permission and uh, <laughs> that went down pretty badly, I can tell you. So let's um, let's jump in um, to a little bit about, um, you know, uh, about your work and, and particularly that your, your, your work at the moment. I, I was um, speaking recently to a parent who was sharing a story about her son, uh, a teenager, and, you know, he'd been at a party and someone had um, – you know, I was talking about suicide and it had been a thing amongst, um, you know, the kids at the party and, and she sort of was thinking, well, where, what's the best resources and what do I do and, and you know, where do I go? And, and you know, I guess I'm not asking for, for particular advice here, but I, I think it, it's something that a lot of parents um, think about at different times. And I thought maybe for the first part of our conversation, we could, before we dig into any 
uh, you know, advice or things to do, maybe, maybe we could just kind of outline, you know, what you're seeing, what you've learned um, in your career, you know, at a, at a broader level, you know, at a societal level um, about the interplay between masculinity and suicide. Yeah, it's a big one, isn't it? And masculinity is such a topical issue at the moment. And um, yeah, but it, it certainly does come up in suicide prevention research. So there's been some research done over the last few years that that shows us that um, I suppose conformity to what we call sort of masculine norms. So thinking about masculinity not as um, you know what men are, but rather the the sort of masculine norms, the kind of unwritten rules about how men should behave and how they um, obviously differ in different places and times and societies. So I kind of come up from that approach, thinking about the the social pressures that are on men to behave in a certain way. And um, there's been research over the last few years that are sort of showing a rather consistent pattern, unfortunately, which is that conformity to some masculine norms can pose um, an increased risk for suicidal thinking and behaviour. And in particular, the norm of self-reliance has been shown to have an association. So we know that there's, a, and, it, and it kind of makes sense in a way, I suppose, it's that sort of wanting or believing that you need to fix all your problems yourself which can, of course, make it harder for people to reach out for help when they when they need it or make them conceal any distress or suicidal risk that they might be experiencing. So it makes it hard for other people to, to intervene and support them as well. So that's certainly come out in the research. And then there's um, um, lots of other, I suppose, because we know that three quarters of suicide deaths in Australia and in many countries are by men. And so there's been a lot of, you know, questioning and thinking about, you know, why is this happening? And um, there's a number of sort of factors that have been shown to be linked to that. Like we know that men often use more lethal means when they attempt suicide, which of course are associated with a higher risk of dying from suicide. Um, and other factors have also been linked with higher suicide risks, such as, um, you know, lower help seeking rates. We know that unfortunately with men, there can be stigma against help seeking, um, higher substance use. Substance use is um, connected to suicidal risk. And we know that suicide sorry, that substance abuse is higher amongst men. Um, there's also um, social connection, which we know sadly often falls away in men's lives as they get older. And that is a risk factor for suicide as well in that social connection is protective against suicide. So there's a lot of thinking about a sort of a range of factors and that's not an exhaustive list um, that might be sort of in some way explaining why the suicide rate is higher amongst men. And now what we're, what we're also coming to understand is some of those factors might be underpinned by those masculine norms. For example, um, you know, masculine norms might get in the way of men having close friendships, you know, mm -hmm. so it might sort of chip away at their, the value of their social connection in their feeling that they're not able to, um, you know, have close, intimate, personal relationships with other men or um, we know that there's stigma against help seeking and so obviously that leads to reduced help seeking and some of that comes back to that sort of norm of self-reliance and pressure to keep things and um, to yourself and solve your problems yourself. Yeah, and even, the, I mean, the choice of more lethal means could arguably be sort of driven by a desire to be sort of more masculine where, you know, a suicide death can be seen as masculine whereas suicide attempts could be seen as, as feminine. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's a very long answer, but I guess the, the short answer is that it's likely playing sort of some direct effect there in perhaps, you know, men's desire to be um, self-reliant and also perhaps some indirect effects there by influencing some of the factors that we know are associated with suicide risk. Mm. So, increasingly, um, suicide prevention interventions are trying to be mindful of the, the gendered context within which men live and looking to unpack some of these risk factors with a um, particular attention to those masculine norms that we might know might be causing some some problems there. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to um, just go back over a few of the things that you said. Um, you were talking about, you know, some of these things around sort of self-reliance. So we, I guess we understand that as, you know, that men have a – a general view in these traditional norms. So the, the messages is that we receive. So our boys and you know, young men are kind of receiving this message that you need to be this kind of lone figure who's able to, you know, solve your problems and, and others. And, you know, you need to, um, you know, just, just be sort of self-determined and, and this is kind of the way in which, which you are. And, and then you're saying that actually that mode or way um, is actually what you would call a risk factor. So that I guess that would mean, um, for the listeners, not to make it too basic, but, um, you know, that 
that if you were higher in that, that you would be potentially at a greater risk of of ending ending your own life? Is it is it as blunt well, as that? Suicidal suicidal thinking definitely. Thinking. Okay. And there's been I think one study that has shown a, a correlation with suicide behaviour. So that okay. would be attempts yeah. or deaths. And I guess the important point to make too is that self reliance in itself isn't a bad thing. Yeah. Obviously, there's plenty of times in your life where you have to be self reliant. You know, you have to, and it's a you know it's a a great trait in many ways that can help people be successful in their life. But I guess it's about um, being flexible about it, you know, mm-hmm. and knowing sort of when to when to be self reliant and when to to reach out for help. You know, sometimes you just need need to suck it up and get through. You know, your year twelve exam or your your meeting at work and walk and, home and through other the rain. T- pardon or walk home through the rain or whatever. That's right. That's right. sometimes you just have to right and and it's and that's the adaptive positive thing to do. But yeah. it's about I suppose when that becomes the only option. You know, when there's yeah. When when um that becomes also the way you're coping with sort of your personal and emotional life. And I guess it's one of the challenges of research, isn't it? Because as a single factor, you know, when we talk about it, it seems to make sense in one level and then you unpack it and go, well, there's actually two parts to it. Um, and, and I guess you would say, particularly in self-reliance, that, yeah, you do. You want – you actually want people to be self-reliant in, in a sense and to be able to self-regulate and, and all of those things, but – um, at some point it, it flips over. And what's your thinking around, is it just the context? Is it that for some of these um, people grew up in a family where it was combined with something else or because um, you were saying earlier that gender and context, you know, were relevant for some of these things? Is it, and I, I guess where I'm going with this line of questioning is, you know, for my parent and I'm thinking about this and I'm I'm thinking, boy, I really want my, my son to be uh, more resilient and I, I actually want him to go and do things by himself. I don't want to be pandering or, you know, always mm. solving his problems, but when's too much? Should I, um, you know, should when, when should I be hard and firm? I mean, I know that they're very big, these are very big questions, but, do, do, you know, what are you, what's your thinking around this? It is a tough one, isn't it? And each kid is different in their level of kind of emotionality and mm. vulnerability. And so, yeah, it, it, it is a tough one, but, um, yeah, I guess it, actually when I you reminded me of when um, I worked on the Man Up documentary. I don't mm. know if, if you saw that. It was on the ABC a few years ago and pops up now and again. But um, we did an evaluation of that um, documentary. So we um, had a we had three hundred and sixty five men actually, and we uh, split them into two groups. Half of them watched the Man Up documentary. Half of them didn't. Well, they they got to watch it later. And then we we had a questionnaire a survey before they watched Man Up and a survey afterwards. And then we looked at the differences between the two groups. But what was really interesting is we also asked them some open-ended questions, you know, about, oh, how did watching Man Up, you know, change things for you, if at all? And what do you think about it? And there was this amazing um, sort of gain in knowledge amongst men through watching Man Up in this sort of increased awareness that other men had struggles, you know, that other men went through stuff, you know, and a lot of comments in um, in our survey after watching Man Up, people were saying things like, I didn't realise other people felt like this. Mm. I didn't I didn't realise other men had struggles like this. I didn't realise that, you know, mental health was an issue for men. And this, this huge kind of raise in awareness. And I think that kind of um, is a really important message in that if everybody's keeping all their stuff to themselves and everybody assumes everyone else is doing okay, but they're, they're not. And so I think, you know, as a parent sort of being sort of transparent around your own struggles, being transparent about your own feelings, I think is, is a huge um, thing to be able to do because that, that was a massive sort of gain for the men that, that watched that documentary. Yeah, that's such a powerful message, isn't it? And I, I think, again, of, um, you know, I keep coming back to, you know, boys and their relational abilities and again the messages they're receiving particularly in the in those primary years about what they need to give away um to belong and i'm referring here to you know the work of judy chu and others you know in that you know that they kind of become these vessels full of all this emotion in a sense but they don't have that you know that support structure or that way of talking that's that's kind of amongst you know, amongst their peers like they're, they're seen they they believe that they need to sort of shut down some of these things to to control, you know, the way they feel. And so they appear, um, you know, more masculine. Um, but the cost of that is, is so high. And, you know, what a, what a terrible sentence to give someone in a way is to say, you know what, all your feelings, um, you know, your desire to connect and love, 
um, to express your own frailty, you know what, actually none of that really belongs in this world for you. Um, Mm -hmm. You need to, you know, you actually just need to bottle that up. And, you know, look, I'm speculating here, but, you know, is it any wonder sometimes that, you know, we have, uh, you know, adolescent kids like adolescent boys, you know, acting out, and, and, you know, with such um, such confronting outcomes, you know, around, um, you know, the things that you're talking about, whether it's suicidal ideation or, or, or enactments and, you know, um, it, it, it's a, it's a, there's a big weight in that. Um, absolutely. Mm, mm. And there's this idea um, that Simon Rice, who I know you've spoken to before on this podcast has talked, might've talked to you about this idea that um, boys express distress in a different way. And a lot of that, I suppose, is because of the perhaps the social pressures on on boys that 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 they're only allowed to express their distress in a certain way. But and but because of that, though, that sometimes their um, struggles can go undetected or underdetected because boys are more likely to do externalizing what we call externalizing behaviours, which might be. And it, and I know this is very typical, and it, it's not not all men and not all women, but. Um, I suppose the picture of depression that we often think about is being, you know, teary and sad and withdrawing. Um, but in fact, you know, a lot of um, boys and men might be expressing sort of externalising symptoms, which would more be more about being angry and being irritable and taking risks and, you know, using substances. And unfortunately, that can often be a very alienating set of behaviours that mean people don't want to engage with them. And unfortunately, it means their distress doesn't always get recognised and, and picked up, so yeah. And, and is, it, is it because it presents as um, as aggression, or it presents as mm. um, antisocial? What we would, I suppose, we'd call it antisocial behaviours. Where um, I think it was Steve Biddoff who said, you know, in schools, you know, it's eighty percent of the of the behavioural challenges are, are boys in terms of. But I'm not sure where he gets that from. But um, you know, are we seeing that that acting out in that way, and in, in the expression that actually this possibly and again if we accept sort of judy's premise around you know boys and relational um stuff that it it could make sense couldn't it again if we're not really giving them that um and i think it is a tom harkin expression how that emotional muscle we're not exercising that um that capacity to be relational it's sort of dormant or being shut down then Mm. then how you know is it any wonder that we see we see antisocial behavior as a as a consequence um, of of not actually being able to be fully engaged and fully connected um, with yeah, our own perhaps internal not. dialogue, yeah, and perhaps that's a sign of a, a boy or a man that's actually experiencing some distress. I'm probably making you a bit uncomfortable with all this speculation as a researcher. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I apologise. A little that. bit. No, I was trying to bring it back to the research. Yeah. It's, the, it's the kind of concept of male depression risk or male yeah. depression. Okay. Yeah. But it's called in the literature and um, it's a kind of a newer concept that yeah, Simon Rice and his colleagues have been doing a lot of work around yeah. and I know they've got a PhD student there that's now looking at male, male anxiety. Right. So, um, yeah, because we know that, you know, when you look at sort of population measures of mental health, women always come up with higher levels or more prevalent levels of depression. But, um, you know, it might just be that, that our distress amongst our boys and men is not being picked up. Yeah, it's so it's yeah. Wow, that's that's uh, there's a lot um, there's a lot in that as well. I think one of the other things that's becoming clearer is just how much research is going on in this, and and I guess how um, you know how many different threads there are, you know, that you could follow, you know. And I think you know to be able to be you know in terms of breadth and depth, you know, in, in your work and going deeper, you know, into the work around suicide prevention, and that that it's probably by its very nature, it's not always possible to really go too broadly because you need to really focus in, you know, on, on a few, a few key pressure points. And, and so what are some of those key, key points that you're sort of looking to focus in on? So yeah, I'm doing some work with um, Tomorrow Man who run their Breaking the Man Code workshops in high schools for adolescent boys who I know you're familiar with in year 10, 11 and 12. So um really interested to do some work with them around evaluating their program. And that's taking a real, what we call upstream approach to suicide prevention, which is a preventative approach, I guess. Mm. So looking at getting upstream, like dealing with um, some of the factors before they go on to create risk for, for boys and men. 
and were boys as they become men. Mm -hmm. So that approach is about, um, it's about challenging um, some of those masculine norms and getting boys to think about sort of those pressures that are in their life. And I suppose being more active in, in an agent in their agency around how they choose to interact with those norms, mm. whether they choose to take them on or do something different. And also about sort of building up some of those protective factors around getting them better at, you know, reaching out to their mates or to their family for help, supporting each other, you know, raising that awareness around, yep, we all struggle. You know, we're all going through some stuff. And I know some of the, the workshops sort of works around, you know, trying to get open up some conversations about that, building social support, so sort of really sort of getting in early to sort of boost the protective factors, maybe reduce some of the negative impacts, I think is um, some really fantastic work that's happening with younger uh, boys and men. And um, yeah, then some of my work, even with, I suppose, adult men or older men is um, similar in a lot of ways, which is about looking to sort of unpack those those masculine norms and the role they're playing and, and encouraging help seeking and encouraging um you know, increased awareness and reducing stigma. So I guess that's where a lot of the kind of intervention work is working at the moment with um, boys and men's suicide prevention. The other side of the coin, however, though, and it's not not my research currently, but um, some of my colleagues in suicide prevention work for men are also interested in making sure that services for boys and men are accessible and are useful for boys and men. You know, this thinking that perhaps some of the services that we do have out there aren't sort of um, male-friendly, if you like, aren't giving boys and men what they need. So there's also some work doing happening on the, the other side of the coin, which is about making sure that when boys and men do reach out for help, that that help is there and that it's useful for them. So I guess that's kind of the two areas, sort of in a nutshell, yeah, I guess that's happening with um, yeah. suicide prevention for boys and men at the moment. Yeah, yeah, and, and powerful work. And certainly, you know, we've seen you know, some of the work that Tomorrow Man do, it's absolutely uh, fantastic. And as you describe it, that's a great way to ex express it as a, sort of the upstream, you know, and a lot of it being around really, it is a lot about connecting. It's a lot about, you know, you know, understanding firstly, and, and I guess um, not to oversimplify it too much, but, you know, being being aware of the different ways of being as, as a self, seeing what's out there and, and the impact that that might have um, on me as a developing boy um, and then starting to, you know, make some proactive choices around the, you know, the really, you know, the genuine me and, and what my values are and, and how, you know, I can positively contribute to the, the people I care about yeah. and, and the society more broadly. And I guess you can do some of that at home as, as parents that so you can create those kinds of, um, you know, environments, um, you know, at home and whether it's in support and discussion and some of those traditional things, I suppose, the family meal or, walking the dog and they can all be sites for, um, you know, healthy conversations about that as well, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not about saying, you know, there's, you know, that masculinity is all wrong or you're doing it all wrong and men have got it all wrong. It's about just, um, I suppose, reflecting on it, unpacking it in your own life, choosing how you want to interact with it and I suppose helping boys um, work out what sort of man they want to be. I just want to take you back. We're talking about the um, you know, the mum that approached me, um, you know, about her boy who'd been hearing things at a party. Um, you know, what, what advice would you give to parents, you know, listening in about becoming more educated, you know, about suicide prevention? And I think that is a really um, distressing situation to be in. I mean, we all fear it so much, don't we? Like we, we hear a lot about suicide. We hear a lot about suicide in young men and we all just live in fear of it as our boys go through those, those years, don't we? So it is, it's, it's a really fright. It can be really frightening, I suppose, to hear that that talk is happening. I mean, but it's wonderful that, that it is happening, you know, that they're reaching out to other. And we do know that um, boys are most likely, well, boys and girls are most likely to reach out to their peer group for help first. So that's, um, it's great that that's happening. I'm also thinking about how there is actually a lot of really good online training that parents or any community members can do, kids can do. And um, that's offered by Living Works, who do a lot of training in Australia. That's one of the, the big providers of suicide prevention mm -hmm. community training in Australia. And um, they have some a variety of programs. I think their Living Works Start is a really um, easy and quick one to do. It's a 90-minute online training program, which um, is free for people living in some parts of Australia at the moment, which I think might 
be some of the people around where you are, Ray. Mm-hmm. But also, even when it's not free, it's not very expensive. Um, I think it's about forty dollars usually, so it's quite an affordable way, and that can give you some really um, sort of basic skills in how to approach someone that you might be worried about, someone who might be expressing. Um, some suicidal thinking and then give you some skills about um, what to talk about with them and how to get them through to sources of support. Because I think um, suicide is still quite a taboo topic in many ways. I think a, a lot of there's a lot of anxiety in the community about, um, you know, how do I ask about it? How do I ask about it without, you know, making someone want to do it more? Mm. You know, is it safe to talk about to someone about it? And and what the hell would I even do if somebody said, yes, yeah, I am thinking about it. So I think it's important to, um, you know, get some training, get some more information, and that'll be a good place to start, I think. And the other thing I wanted to say about um, kids and teenagers is that, you know, oftentimes I think adolescents and young adults can feel, even adults can feel like it's it's a really stressful thing to go through when someone tells you that they're feeling suicidal and I wouldn't want any young person to feel like they had to shoulder that on their own. Mm. You know, that it is okay if somebody's not safe, it's okay to tell someone else about it. You know, so mm. you might have been sworn to secrecy because I don't want anyone else to know that I'm feeling this way, but I think it's important for a young person to know that they don't need to carry that on their own, that it is too big a problem for any one person and that it's okay to tell somebody else if you're worried about one of your friends. Mm, that's great. And, and Living Works was the, was the website yeah. and we'll, we'll include a, a link to that in the, in the show notes as well. So we're rounding the, uh, the final bend. It's been such a pleasure um, to speak with you, Kylie, um, to hear about your story and, and the work that you're doing such well, such powerful work and such important work, um, you know, when we when we consider the, the raw statistics around suicide um, in this country and, and internationally really. Um, uh, it's so wonderful to have people like yourself really, you know, with that vocational commitment to um, really making a difference, which is, which is absolutely fantastic. I had two last questions. One was if you had a story that you could tell a 14-year-old boy and he'd listen, what would the story be? That's a great question because I've got a 15-year-old boy and he doesn't listen to very much. So <laughs> I'd be interested in that wisdom <laughs> from someone else as well. But um, thinking about that, I think that the stories that he listens to most are the stories um, that are honest, you know, like if I talk about, yeah, when I was a, when I was your age, I really struggled with this, you know, or this was tough when I was a, when, when I was a kid or when I was younger. And I think he listens to that when he can hear that we're being honest and that we're sharing something of ourselves. I think that. And then, of course, I mean, the other thing too, I think is he really listens to stories about from people that he um, looks up to, mm-hmm. you know, like footballers and yeah. role models. He will um, he really listens to any stories about those. So I've been so pleased when I see things, you know, in the media about footballers sharing their stories about how they dealt with mental health problems or how they dealt with personal problems. And, um, yeah, sometimes I might bring that up in a conversation and, yeah, yeah, I think he real. really listens to those kind of stories as well. Isn't it funny though? Because I'm just thinking as I'm saying that, Ray, that just before you said it, it all comes back to connection, and it does, doesn't it? That being like connecting with the the when I'm being honest and when I'm sharing something personal about myself, or when he hears a personal story about someone else, it all comes back to that connection, doesn't it? Mm, I think so. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Connecting to your own story, and it's such a great thing. I've seen it so many times in uh, you know in sharing circles and. Um, you know, I, I guess seeing people, particularly young people, you know, I'm in, in a school and, you know, seeing people moved um, when they hear stories from all sorts of people, you know, you don't, you, you I think sometimes we think about the, um, you know, the extraordinary lives that people live, but sometimes there's just a, uh, a, a beauty in the, in the ordinary struggle as well. Um, and, and that can be also at times quite a poignant uh, moment for people just to be able to hear you know, something mm. said and something spoken just, just from the heart um, as well. And my last question is, what is it to be a good man these days? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Except the easy one for last. <laughs> what is it to be a good man? Goodness, that is a tricky one, isn't it? But I guess, I, I mean, I'm thinking about sort of my research, which is about, you know, the pressures that men live under to behave a, a certain way and that might not always be 
um, consistent with the the life they want to live. So I guess being a good man is being able to to choose the life and the the masculinity that's that's right for you, that's true for you, and to be able to model that in the world. I think that makes a, a pretty good man. I think that's a great place um, for us to to finish our conversation. Uh, today. Thank you again, Kylie. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you. And as I said earlier, you know, thank you for the great work that you do. Um, good luck with all the, the new evaluations and programs and uh, research and, and inquiry that you have. Um, you know, may it, may it bear fruit positively in the lives of, um, you know, of the people that you're seeking to influence. Thank you, Ray. That's lovely. And it's, and it's also very um, sort of inspiring for me too, to hear about the work that you guys are doing. And about how that sort of plays out, you know, in the real world, away from research. So it's really nice to be connected with you and to be hearing about the work that you're doing as well. We hope you've enjoyed this Understanding Boys podcast. Make sure you subscribe on your podcast app and please leave us a review to help grow the community. For more information about the podcast, please visit understandingboys.com.au. Until next time, thanks for listening.